It's my pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Ron Jackson. Uh, Ron is a longtime affiliate of our Cool Climate Enology and Viticulture Institute. He's a well-renowned uh, wine writer and author. Uh, we actually use several of his textbooks in, in the teaching of our undergraduate enology and viticulture uh, uh, courses, so it's uh, just an extreme honor to have you uh, with us here today. Uh, Ron obtained his Bachelor of Science and his Master's from Queen's University and did his PhD at the University of Toronto, where he specialized in the physiology of the fungus we're going to talk about today, of botrytis. His sabbatical uh, at Cornell University expanded his interest in all things technical relative to uh, the immunology. While professor and chair at the botany department at Brandon University, he became a technical advisor to the Manitoba Liquor Control Commission. Uh, he is author of Wine Science Principles and Application. I'm sure many of our students in the audience are quite well aware and familiar with that book. Uh, wine Tasting, a Professional Handbook, got that book as well. And Conserve Water, Drink Wine, and of course, uh, many assorted technical reviews. He now spends his full time devoted to writing, uh, which he says was one of the smartest moves that he ever made. So, with that, Ron, I'll let you take it. Well, thank you very much. The, the only other really wise decision I ever made was to marry the person I did. <laughs> that, 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 number one. <laughs> number two was to retire early. Uh, okay, well, my topic is about uh, Dr. General Mr. Hyde Fungus, a good old Petraeus scenario. Uh, I've had mm, almost a half a century associated with uh, this schizoid fungus. And uh, it, it started out for my uh, master's. And uh, at that time, uh, I was young and foolish. Now I'm just old and foolish. Uh, and uh, when, when uh, I went to my professor and told him that I uh, had to destroy this fungus, it was causing me misery. And uh, I was the uh, later day St. George and Petritus was the dragon, and I was going to uh, slay it from the face of this thirst. Uh, Dr. Good then looked at me and said he was very encouraged by my enthusiasm. However, he then made one little comment, and he said, well, how many years are you spending uh, to get your master's? And uh, well, uh, I started to do a double take and decide, well, maybe I ought to trim back just a touch uh, my uh, extension of what I was going to do. And initially, but was very nice to me. Because it, it is this schizoid fungus, sometimes it's nice, sometimes it's most of the time very nasty. And so initially it was nice, uh, it actually allowed me to get out of Queens in 11 months with my masters. So I pretty happy. So I rush off to Toronto and that will all whack off a PhD in a couple of years, and then I'll be able to make lots of money. And uh, that then, of course, Petraeus turned nasty. Uh, and, uh, Mr. Nasty, and of course, I smashed my head against the wall for about two and a half years. And apparently, according to modern neurological studies, it is not good for the gray matter inside your head to smash your head against the wall for two and a half years. Uh, but eventually, uh, my good old fungus it came through for me and uh, was nice and gave me my PhD and of course the data just rolled in just like it had for my master's and everything was fine. So Petritus uh, was my good guy and uh, as you can tell from the color of my hair if nothing else that I'm one of these Antiquarian types and it's the first time I've ever done a PowerPoint presentation but I do know what PowerPoint means. Even though I am this old guy, and, uh, and uh, if we go to the first slide, whoop, if I go the right way, now that is PowerPoint. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, so, okay. Well, other than that, oh, okay. Uh, it uh, has this schizoid character. Uh, most people who know anything about Petritus grapes know that it is 
the ignoble funnels. It causes ignoble rob, a bunch of rob, whatever. And most people uh, shiver at the thought of this thing, because normally it just turns the grains into useless mush uh, for which you can make no valuable wine whatsoever. However, on certain special conditions, it does make some ungodly wonderful wine. Just seraphic and delight. And then this is one example. Uh, this is from Germany, uh, Charles Hopper Auschwitz, and uh, it, it's uh, one of my preferred styles of the French wines, but certainly not the only. And here is, if we're going to the first of the lot, uh, this is the Dubai uh, uh, Azu Azencia. Uh, this is a bottle I had. I still have another one, 1964. Uh, back then it was pricey. I looked on the Liquor Commission to get an indication of how much uh, would it put me back if I brought a bottle of that, and it's approximately $400 for 500 mils. So, uh, you're not getting that one. <laughs> <laughs> you're getting the next one now. Uh, a little more reasonable was only about 89 of uh, 500 mils, so that's a little bit better. And then we have uh, the French version that lots of people know about, uh, the Sauternes. So, uh, those are examples of uh, the good side of Petritus. But to get on to Petritus itself, uh, this is the Canidia 4 of uh, Petritus. And uh, it looks something like a grape cluster. And enough like a grape cluster that that's where the name comes from. In the good old days, when everybody knew Latin, Greek, uh, you're going to name something, then you look up and remember your good old Greek. And here we have uh, Batros, uh, the Greek for Greek cluster. And so Petraeus comes from it. But Petraeus, the, this is the imperfect state, uh, as my colleagues call it, for this fungus. And uh, this is its perfect state. Uh, that it's the cup fungus in the ascomycetes, and uh, at least this type one actually does look like a cup, and it is produced from a black structure. Uh, this is called a sclerotia. And when my wife first saw the things that I worked with, she was kind of repelled. Oh my God, uh, those look like mouse drawings. Uh, <laughs> you mean you work with those things? Oh yeah, they're they're very nice, and uh, it, it produces the the sexual stage. And uh, but this is what you would find in a vineyard. Exactly, that this does come from a vineyard in, in Byland, uh, where the uh, these, these are uh, dried up, what are called mummified berries, and uh, there's a bit of sporulation scattered around, and this is the asexual stage, the conidial stage of the fungus. And uh, for survival over from one year to another, it normally survives as sclerotia, or uh, as sclerotia in these, uh, this could be a stem, uh, I forget exactly what it was now, and the sporulation from the sclerotia and that is how it survived the work, basically from one year to another, at least in the vineyard. So if we uh, talk about the disease phase itself, uh, it does, that this is its really nasty side. Okay, well, uh, we start off in the winter, the, the fungus is growing on leaves and uh, rats and fruit and so on, and they fall down, uh, they survive for Primarily as sclerotia, and it can also survive as mycelium in the tissue. And then in the spring, it starts to sporulate. And normally, you won't see the uh, the sexual state of fungus. It's probably there, but it's not particularly common in the Petritus scenario. And if you wanted to see it, basically, you would have to get down on your hands and knees, or even better, on your belly. Uh, good old mycological position for looking for 
uh, hot fungi that are normally down your belly crawling around. Uh, and uh, it, if you find it in little dips, uh, you could potentially find them, but normally it is the asexual state. The, the first structures that tend to be infected are the flowers. So the flowers, uh, they get infected and then it progresses on and uh, what tends to happen is that the uh, flower parts become infected and then they dry down and the fungus actually starts to uh, invade the very green berry. But the acidity level in the berry is very high and is producing resveratrol and these other compounds that slow the fungus down. It actually invades the berry but then stops. Uh, just uh, it's a nascent infection. And for the rest of the season, uh, nothing essentially happens. The berry grows and larges and everything else. Uh, the fungus is still alive inside the berry, but it's not doing anything. And really, things uh, start to happen when the berry starts to mature. When the berry starts to mature, resveratrol level may go down, and it's becoming senescent, and at this time the fungus can start to infect again. So this is the probably the most significant phase of the fungus as far as uh, the infection of the berry is this initial stage. And for that reason, that's why normally they recommend for best protection against uh, botrytis is that you will spray your fungicide uh, at, uh, at bloom, 80% uh, catfall, and, and then uh, when the berries start to uh, close up, three basic times normally are spraying for control because you want to control this initial phase. If conditions are very bad at harvest time, okay, you will get secondary infections coming in from almost anywhere. The greatest scenario is not a selective pathogen. It can grow on tens of thousands of different plants. They're just given the chance. It uh, grows on senescing tissue. It's not really a uh, dedicated pathogen, but though it, it uh, will start to cause these infections. And, uh, okay, if the conditions are very poor, then you get lots of rainfall, uh, heavy, especially if you have heavy rain moisture, then botrytis can take over, and it can go very, very fast. So that, that's basically the, uh, the life cycle of the fungus, and here we show uh, the berry, and you can see these little spots that anyone used to botrytis automatically, oh my god, that was right, uh, and so it's growing on in the old flower parts. And here's a cross section through the berry where the fungus is located in here, up here, it's at the base here, in various places in the berry. And it's just remaining there until the season goes on. Uh, this is what can happen if you have a heavy rain uh, when the berries are getting mature. Uh, this is the uh, stomata uh, on the fruit. Here is a crack next to the stone tip. It, it tends to crack there, and, and that is representing the fungus, and it will invade along the crack. And also, if you have heavy rain, then you can get these pores developing in the cuticle. And again, an ideal place for the fungus to penetrate. Uh, one of the protective measures of the fungus or the uh, grape against uh, various fungi are, of course, the bloom. And the bloom are, in fact, these plates of wax on the surface. Uh, when the berry is young, and uh, they'll look like this, uh, what we have over on this side is where berries are pressed against one another. The plates are broken, crushed, and we have pores and splits, uh, a little depression here, 
and that this is a pore going right through the cuticle. And then these are some standard uh, fungicidal agents, uh, the, the standard kind of run of the old things. Uh, this one is a new agent, and uh, the advantage of it is that not only is it systemic, but it stimulates the, the berry to have systemic resistance. So, so just spraying the plant will uh, overall enhance the resistance of uh, the plant. Uh, conditions favoring for uh, the, the uh, if we have great culture with thick skin, uh, if we're now starting to look at the positive side uh, when we get uh, botrytis wines, the, the good side of the thing. Well, what is called noble rot, or of the term noble. Uh, if the grapes have thick skins, it is, well, I, it's hard to say ideal, but certainly much preferential for developing botrytis grapes, the poor term noble. Uh, what it does is it limits the ability of the fungus to penetrate, and ideally, uh, the development is better if it starts from inside the berry rather than outside. And also, uh, when you harvest the grapes, if the grapes are botrytis in the noble fashion, then you have to harvest them manually. But even when you harvest them manually, you don't want to mangle them or knock them around very much. Because underneath the skin, and in the case of the noble rot, the fungus tend to remain just underneath the skin. And it produces uh, be the glucans. These are very viscous material. And if the viscous gets disturbed into the juice, or well, once you crush or press, well, normally you don't crush these, you just press them gently, then if these beta glucans get all mixed in, then it makes just a bugger of uh, trying to filter the stuff. So the last thing you want to do is disturb these things. Um, if you have soil that permits very deep rooting, this tends to minimize the likelihood to very heavy rain that uh, it'll take up lots of water, and at this time the berries will swell quickly and rupture. And of course, if it ruptures, then certainly juice is going to come out, and this means various Secondary saprophytes can get in, the tritus can get in, and you're kind of tending towards the ignoble rot. Uh, what are the conditions that favor the botrytization of the grapes in the noble sense? Well, it's very unique climatic conditions. Several weeks before and during harvest, you want to have this cycling of cool, humid conditions at night. At this uh, state, the fungus is growing. And in the daytime, what you want is sunny, dry, warm conditions. And the next night, cool, damp, fungus starts to grow. Daytime, nice and dry, fungus shuts down. And, but it's producing uh, its fructification, uh, where it produces the spores, and uh, these the spores, the conidiflores, function like wicks. And in, in the warm, sunny day, water is just being evaporated off. So this continues on uh, for two or three weeks, and, and so there are certain areas in the globe that this tends to happen naturally almost every year. You have the soap damp region in France. You have along the Mosul and the Rheingau in Germany. You have the Takai region in Hungary. You have the uh, Rooster region in Austria. Uh, there's an area in Italy where they make pico uh, It's another region. And of course there are certain areas in California and uh, Australia. And just depend if at the right time, you have this 
oddball set of situations where we have this cool moist at night and uh, most of these places tend to be either close to a water body, either a large river or a lake, and what happens is the humidity comes off the water onto the land and it favors the fungus and then of course during the daytime everything cools down. So the, those are the special conditions which uh, permit it, and uh, this is basically what it starts to look like. Uh, often, only selected parts of a cluster get infected for whatever reason. And here we have the healthy, fully healthy grapes. Here we have some that are infected and some that are very shriveled. And uh, this is uh, how it looks. And the, the purplish color, uh, nobody has actually looked at what this is, but presumably uh, you've got leucoanthocyanins in the skin, and uh, the botrytis produces lactase, which is a phenol oxidase, a very extensive range of substrates, and presumably it is turning these leucoanthocyanins into a purplish pigment. And uh, here's a fully botrytis uh, cluster. Uh, you can certainly see loads of botrytis forms uh, growing all over these. And, uh, initially, when uh, I was uh, publishing wine science, and they asked me, well, uh, what picture would you like on the cover? And uh, so this is my first idea. Uh, I thought, what did you do? Beautiful. It just, just makes you swoon when you look at it. <laughs> Wonderfully infected grapes. Oh my God, it's wonderful. Uh, well, what more could you ask that is so inspiring for people? Everybody wants to buy it well, just because of the picture on it. And uh, the uh, marketing agents of Academic Press had a different view uh, than I. Uh, I guess they were plantologists to start with. And, so they, they seem to think that mold and rot is something disgusting. Uh, it's, I don't know why they, their training wasn't appropriate to appreciate the quality of this. But uh, anyway, uh, they, they put their thumbs out and that, that was it. But, uh, they selected uh, a wonderful photograph uh, of ruby red <laughs> grapes. Oh, whoopee, all I need is table grades on my book online now. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, uh, that's the way it went. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, well, what does uh, actually happen uh, during the process? Well, you have certainly partial dehydration. Uh, it goes down to about half its weight. Uh, the sugar content goes way up. Uh, even though the botrytis is actually metabolizing sugars, because it slightly metabolizes glucose versus fructose, the fructose content goes up even higher. Uh, the acidity either stays stable or goes up slightly, uh, but uh, you certainly have a drop in tartaric acid content. Uh, the botrytis is one of those funny fungi that actually will metabolize tartaric acid. It doesn't do much on malic acid, but it certainly uh, gets rid of tartaric acid. It oxidizes all sorts of phenolics and uh, terpenoids. So if you have any grape that has uh, wonderful terpenoid flavors and aromas, uh, when it goes through uh, this process with botrytis, it basically oxidizes them all and so you don't detect them anymore. So uh, there's almost no sense, uh, to me, logically, taking the versatimeter and turning it into a trash spine. Well, you're wiping out uh, all the essential characteristics of uh, uh, that grape variety. Uh, great augmentation of glycerol content goes away and way up. Uh, accumulation of these beta-glucans, the, the ones that clog filters, uh, gluconic acid, a classic indicator of botrytis wine, the simplest of them. Uh, the fungus itself produces uh, soaked alone, uh, one octene, three all, and other flavorants. And, uh, 
Okay, potential spike in acetic acid in methyl acetate. Uh, this is one of the classic risks in going for uh, botrytis wines is that you will always have acetobacter growing on the surface of the grape. And if you have just a little bit too much moisture, then the acetobacter will just go wild, it'll produce lots of acetic acid, and of course when you're fermenting the wine, acetic acid and ethanol will be, and there we have ethyl acetate, and you have wonderful cutex in your wine. It certainly smells like cutex. So some uh, actual details, uh, fresh weight, very much sexual blonde, and signal, and then this is from Sauterre. Uh, so we're starting at 225 to down to 112, 22 down to 98. Sugar content certainly going up. And acidity level mm, pretty much stable. Uh, tartaric acid certainly dropping significantly. Uh, malic acid going up, but that's relative. Uh, the, the actual content has gone down but because uh, you're taking out 50% of the water or more. Uh, obviously, its content is going up, but even tartaric acid, it's going down so much, even though it's being concentrated. Citric acid, uh, not much change. Gluconic acid, of course, goes way up. The characteristic feature of botrytis. Ammonia goes down, thymine goes down, pH, not that much multiplied. Disadvantages of going that route. Certainly, definite, uh, risk of total crop loss. Uh, if you want to go the, the whole hog road, uh, certainly you're going to get reduced yield. Uh, ice wine is the same thing. You're reducing yield, uh, slightly. Uh, you definitely have to have manual harvest. You wouldn't want to do that by machine. And selective really depends on uh, which style one is making which type of selective harvesting you're going to do, and I'll talk about that briefly in a few minutes when I get to talk about the different styles. Uh, slow whole berry crushing. And the purpose of that, again, is to try and avoid getting all these beta-glucans mixed in with uh, the juice, and of course, then into the wine and all the problems associated with that. Uh, you're certainly going to have potential problems with fermentation. Uh, you have low thymine levels, normally the end thymine, uh, to get over that problem. But you do have the problem because you are dealing with very high uh, bridge level uh, juice. Now that's going to cause problems for the coral yeast EBC. Uh, you have risk of secondary fermentation in the bottle. Uh, almost always they will make sure that the wine has considerable residual sugar. These are always dessert wines. And uh, because we have all this residual sugar, then you have the risk of potential secondary fermentation in the bottle, and, and normally you have to suffer quite a bit to make, certainly try and limit this occurrence. And then we have another little uh, associated with uh, the price wines, and this is music acid crystallization. Uh, what happens here is that uh, the fungus does produce this acid called music acid, and over time, after about four, five, six, ten years or so in the bottle, then these will crystallize and fall out. And uh, occasionally people might bring it back and say, well, what are these yellowish crystals? formed in the bottle and that is just mustic acid. No sensory significance whatsoever, but it, it does have a visual uh, aspect to it. Now getting on to the individual styles uh, of wine. So if we look at uh, Takagi, uh, the Hungarian, Hungarian wine, it is the first of the known to be Petritus wines. Known to be means in literature. Uh, there are ancient Roman wines and Greek wine which are described in a manner which could be interpreted, if you want to interpret it that way, as indicating that they were making some Petritus wines too.
But this is all supposition. Uh, the first, sure enough, first uh, were the ones in uh, this Takagi region of Hungary. And the first recording is about 1560. Let me start there. And it really got going in the early 1600s. Uh, okay. Most of, uh, okay, in Hungary, what they normally will do, they will go out and selectively harvest clusters that have petrus grapes on them. So they'll bring those in. And then they'll cut them out from the healthy ones. The healthy ones go to one side, the botrytis ones are set aside, and they're put in kind of a bucket, uh, a uh, kind of a wicker basket thing. So they just pile them in there, and then, of course, uh, they may go out another week later and collect some more. And they're taking all these botrytis ones and putting in this ba basket called a putnoid. And so they just sit it there, and if they want to make the very special style, the Azenzia style, they just let them sit. And they collect the juice that drips out. Uh, the juice that drips out is what is called the Azenzia. And they make it just from that. And of course, not too surprising why it's about $400 of the half bottle. <laughs> Uh, the rest of it, well, it's it really hard to know, you can't say this is exactly how they do it in Tukati because various producers do different things. Uh, but most of the wine that they're going to make will be not the Azencia. Uh, if they do make some Azencia, they take the juice after a couple of weeks and then they take the berries and then they slowly press them. And uh, they take the juice or the, uh, the pumice as well. They take, it depends on who it is, what they want to do. And uh, they put that aside. And then they start filling a barrel well, with this juice or pumice. <laughs> put that in. And it depends on how many of these containers, which contain about 30 liters. So put noyos is roughly around 30 liters, and from the Zensia you get one to one and a half liters out of 30. Uh, and so you get one half liters out of the 30 that goes to your Zensia, the rest uh, goes and into these other styles, uh, which are basically identified as Takai Azu. The, the Petraeus berries are called Azu. Then they designate them as whether it's a three put no yolks or a four put no yolks or a five put no yolks or a six because you're filling these in and whatever is not full at the end, you pour in regular juice on top. And when you get to six, basically you're full. So there aren't any seven put no yolks because then they can't put any more in. So, so that, that, that's the range. And, uh, so we have our azure paste, uh, classified, basically on holiday. And they put them in these barrels. The barrels are a bit larger than your regular berry. They're about 136 liters. They leave them partially empty. They allow them to ferment. And uh, they leave them in there for a while. And there is some slight oxidation of the wine. Uh, this is detectable because of the Acetal, uh, acetaldehyde, acetone, and other chemical that uh, you find in the wine. Uh, fermentation is always very cool. Uh, and the alcohol contents are comparatively low. Uh, they're about, uh, well, the uh, six foot noyum that I have is 11% alcohol. That'd be kind of standard. German Petritus, uh, they started to be made around 1750. So that, uh, about 100 years later than 
the Hungarian version. And uh, they're divided again on uh, a categorical system. Uh, we had the Auschwitz, the Baron Auschwitz, and the Trocken Baron Auschwitz. Uh, the Auschwitz ones are derived from these specially selected whole clusters of late harvested fruit. Uh, you'll see that nothing there actually says Petritus grapes. Doesn't have to be. Normally is, but does not necessarily have to be Petritus grapes. These are just specially late harvest selected clusters of grape. Barren, obviously, is a, of course, most of you probably know it. Uh, barren and the berry, outpick, oslazen, and derived from individually selected berries from late harvest of fruit. And the trocken berry now is laser, that this is where the dried berries that have been outpicked, the super petritus version. And then, so when they go out and harvest, in Germany often they'll, again, depending on the estate and how much uh, money they're they think they can get for the wine, they will go through three times for the harvest. They'll do a regular harvest day where they're making their uh, ordinary uh, Riesling wine. And uh, the, the cabinet and the spade laser. Cabinet would be the first lot, because that's on the harvest day. Spade laser, that's about a week or so later, and uh, that would become the spade laser, and then after another week or so, then, then you get into the Auschwitz styles. And uh, so you, you can actually make an Auschwitz, a barren Auschwitz, and a trocken barren Auschwitz uh, out of the same harps, grapes that are harps. It just depends on how you want to select them. If you want to just take all the very dried ones, then you get your trocken barren Auschwitz. If you want to have just kind of mix, barren Auschwitz, and Auschwitz, and the regular. Uh, okay. Okay. Certainly, by law, the uh, minimum uh, sugar level has to go up. It's not just when you harvest. There is also uh, dictates relative to the sugar content of the berries, and typically they tend to be low alcohol content. The German ones tend to be much lower than anybody else's. Uh, the Sauterne is the highest uh, of the three basic categories, Germans the lowest, and the Hungarian in between. They can go down to seven. You usually it could be eight, nine, depending on uh, how they want to do it. And in Germany, of course, uh, they do the fermentation in open cellars. So it's quite cool. So this cooler condition will slow the whole fermentation process and they, they can stop the fermentation when they want. They, they can either take it and filter it to filter up all the yeast or they, they will just put in enough sulfur dioxide to stop the fermentation so they get the residual sugar content that they desire. And we have our Sauterne, the best known of the French, uh, the Tritus one, not the only one. Uh, again, how a producer is going to harvest will depend on the producer. If you shatter the kim, well, which is the top of the lot, and for which you pay the most, they will definitely do a selected harvest where they go through many times, and they actually have the pickers going through and picking out the uh, petritus grapes from the cluster and leaving the rest of the cluster there to continue on going through bottomization process. Uh, if you're a less prodigious producer and you can't charge as much, then basically they go through and do a single harvest and then they select the petritus grapes out from them. And what is not infected by petritus, they will then set aside and make a uh, white dry wine. Uh, one of the most prominent uh, differences between the two styles is that the French ones generally are 11 to 13 percent alcohol. So they're, they're quite a bit higher. Uh, can get up to 14, 15. Uh, so it's 
really a marked difference uh, between the various styles. And uh, sadly, uh, I've had Shabby Ken several times, and on most occasions, I've refused to drink it. Uh, it had way too much ethyl acetate. I happen to be very, very sensitive to that compound. Uh, other people are not, thankfully, uh, <laughs> because if you're going to spend two or three hundred dollars a bottle, uh, you'd better not touch too much out of the last day if it's going to be there and uh, to be happy with your uh, result. Now we get to something that seemed to be out of kilter. Uh, what on earth do I have any red wine? showing up on the screen when I'm supposed to be talking about Vitritis wine. Well, this is a Vitritis wine. Uh, so here we have our uh, Amarone from Valpolicella. Uh, lots of people will know Valpolicella and it's kind of a, it's a pleasant red wine. I uh, think to uh, write home about too much. Uh, but the Amarone version, oh yes indeed, that is definitely worth writing home about. And well, when I first tried this stuff, boy, this is great stuff. Uh, I loved it, but it had a distinctive aromatic character to it. And my oh my, that is really, pretty really distinctive. Now, there's no other red wine that smells like this. And it reminded me of oxidized phenols. And uh, oh, I don't mind oxidized phenols. And I thought that's kind of neat. And I also happen to be a gardener. It's almost as somebody had come along and taken some uh, essence of tulip and daffodil and added it to the wine. Because if you go and most people don't go sniffing tulip because it smells like uh, oxidized phenols. <laughs> Not really your nice terpenoids, and, uh, but uh, Amarone had that. And, uh, I really wondered, um, but uh, initially I couldn't figure out what it was. And uh, then uh, it happened to be I was writing wine science and uh, I wanted to make my book as unique as conceivably possible. And niche marketing, you know. And so I thought, well, I'll, I'll try and write about all sorts of wine styles that nobody else talks about. Nobody's talking about Amarone, nobody's talking about Petrus wines, the uh, Dan Santo, uh, Maceration Carbonique, and all these good styles. So, so I'll dig up all the stuff. Of course, all the stuff on uh, Maceration Carbonique, it's in French. Well, thankfully, I, I don't have to read that stuff, and, but uh, I knew the stuff on Amarone, whatever it was, probably going to be in Italian. I don't read any Italian. Zilch. Uh, and, but I wrote away, and uh, I got this paper back. And, oh my god. Uh, I, I'm, it's all Italian, I'm looking through the yeah, ads, a nice paper. But I do recognize Petritus when I see it. And there is Petraeus in there. Oh my god, you're talking about my fungus. Woohoo! Hey, now this is me. And uh, let me show this picture. <laughs> ah, there we are. Uh, these are your ordinary, just pride grapes. These are the Petraeus ones. And I looked at those. I said, yeah, okay, that, that could be it, but where's the fungus? Uh, and this is the really weird, one of the many weird things about uh, this uh, Amarone wine is that uh, the fungus infects in a nascent form uh, when the berries are very young. They harvest them, everything looks perfect, uh, the grapes are as beautiful as you could ask. And the next thing they do with them, whoop, Oh, oh, I must, have I skipped? Ah, yes, back here. Uh, they harvest them and they put them on these trays. And they leave them there for between two and three months. Uh, 
into December and January. They're, they're there, they go and uh, turn them over every once in a while. It's open to the air. It's very cool in, in, in Italy and in Verona. Still pretty, pretty chilly, uh, our weather right now. And uh, so they stay there and they slowly dry. And they keep the humidity root as low as possible uh, so that you don't want them to start to rot. But the fungus starts to grow within the berry. And it's actually uh, causing a botrytization of the grapes, but it's not producing any sporulation on the surface. That was odd. And what really blew me uh, right out of the water when I started reading about Amarone is a Petrus wine. Because Amarone is red. This should not be. It should be brown. Well, admittedly, when you look at Amarone, uh, relative to its age, it has that brownish green. Brown. Ah, so, looks older than it really is. Well, that's because of lacquers. Uh, but normally, will completely oxidize your anthocyanins in the red grapes and they turn them brown. And Amarone still is not brown, it's still distinctively red. So something that no one had looked at yet is going on inside these grapes. The lacase is produced, but it is, or it's, the amount is being produced is very, very low because certainly the anthocyanins are not being turned brown. People have made uh, botrytis wine from red grapes, but normally this is out in the field and they are distinctively brown. There is no red left. So here we are, uh, Italian red wine, partially botrytis. It doesn't have to be though. So you, you can't go every year and pick up an Amarone and be sure it's Petritus. It doesn't have to be. The law doesn't stipulate that it has to be. Uh, okay, here are the healthy grapes laid out, to dehydrate, lose about quarter percent of the water, patient infections, lactase, standard chemical changes. And uh, here is as good an indicator that uh, Amarone is detritus as anything else, gluconic acid. You only find it in detritus grapes, nothing else. And here we have uh, a Sauterne, a German TBA, Prop Baron Auslager, and essentially the levels of gluconic acid are the same, indicating intensely infected grapes. The only way you're going to get that. Uh, there's another indicator, and here is your glycerol content. High glycerol content in all of them. Another very strong indicator of botrytis uh, scrapes. And uh, there we are uh, at the end, and uh, I would like to end talks by uh, giving a, a couple quotes from Mark Twain. Uh, Mark Twain uh, was very good at uh, making these comments. And he said it is a, a terrible death to be docked to death. And uh, he had another comment that the brain can only absorb what the seat can withstand. <laughs> so, uh, I'm open to any questions if anybody has any sorts of questions. Uh, and, and shut down when we continue on. So, right now, if there's any questions, uh, I'm sure Dr. Jackson will be happy to answer. Yes? Uh, you mentioned that um, <coughs> the tritus becomes active once the grapes start to ripen, and you also mentioned resveratrol declining. Yes. Is there a connection? Does resveratrol play a role? Oh! 
Normally, resveratrol is an antifungal agent that the plant produces. Well, certainly it has that action. Uh, but botrytis, one of the effects of its lactate is it oxidizes resveratrol and then activates it. And also normally in grapes as they mature, frequently the uh, level of resveratrol drops. But certainly botrytis is going to speed that up for the sense of what? Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, well, I would uh, like to thank uh, Dr. Jackson for his uh, uh, very interesting talk today and give you a small token of our appreciation thank for, you very much. for joining us today. Uh, and also just to remind the group that uh, next week, uh, we actually have two lectures next week. And so on Wednesday, it's uh, uh, Jerry Nielsen and Dan O'Gorman that are coming to us from the Pacific Agra Food uh, Research Center in Summerlin, British Columbia. Uh, talking about using nitrogen fertilizers to increase, increase grape quality and also on grapevine trunk diseases. And the next day, you may recall this winter we had a snow day and we had to cancel one of our lectures. So our, our own uh, uh, Michael Rittmeister uh, will be talking, uh, giving us a talk about memory in a bottle, heritage identity, and wine in Niagara. So I look forward to seeing uh, everybody again next week, and we'll sign off uh, uh, to the group and then continue with our tasting. Thank you.